Jairus always called her his little girl. Right from the time she was walking, she was Jairus's shadow. She followed her daddy everywhere he went. She never wanted to stay home with mama. She wanted to go to the synagogue. She wanted to go to the market. She wanted to go to work with her dad, Jairus. And so she did. He took her everywhere. She was a shadow. So he was always carrying her around. Everybody loved to see his little girl. And so she was such a part of his life as she grew older, uh, out of the toddler years, uh, she actually began to take on some of the responsibilities uh, with her dad as he would go about his business and go about the things that he would do all the time. She had her own jobs that she would do each day. Each day started the same way. Jairus would go into his daughter's room and say, Talitha, get up. And she'd jump out of bed, eager to be with her dad and to please him that day. She would go to work with him, Talitha, sweep the floor. She would uh, go and help him deliver things. Talitha, let's move these supplies. You know, she would go to the synagogue and help him work out the things he had to do there. Uh, Talitha, uh, make sure you put these things over here, do that stuff over there. He was always, he was always taking her with him everywhere that he went. This daddy and little Talitha, they were inseparable all the time. And then it would all start again the next day. Talitha, get up. And they would head out for the day's adventure. Years and years go by, and, and now she's coming of age in this Jewish culture. You know, she's kind of growing up and and outwardly, she protests when her dad calls her his little girl. She pretends like she doesn't like that, but inside, she really loves that her daddy still sees her that way. Yeah, and that's where we pick up the story. That's where we catch up to kind of where we left off last week in Mark chapter 5. I hope you're reading along with me in chapter 5, verse 21. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, crowd gathered about him and he was beside the sea yeah does this sound familiar because we're picking up again on the same sequence of events that was happening back to back to back right jesus had been there in capernaum teaching and doing his ministry and this sequence kind of started with jesus taking an entire day of teaching just a lot of teaching that he was doing and unpacking the parables with the disciples. And then at the end of that day, remember they got in the boat and they left Capernaum, they went across. And on the way across, they had to go through something terrible. What was it? Come on, what was it? The storm, the mega storm. It was the mega storm that came along and they got through it. Jesus spoke to the storm and then there was, after the mega storm, there was what? Mega peace, mega calm, it said. Yeah, and they got to the other side, to the region of the Gerasenes, and they were greeted there late at night by, by who? Come on, you were here last week. Demon guy, right? It wasn't just a demon, it was a, a legion of demons. And so, you know what happened there? Uh, Jesus tells the demons to come out. They negotiate to go into the pigs. And for whatever reason, Jesus lets them go into the pigs. And the pigs run off the cliff. So the townspeople love Jesus. Right? And no, no? Is that not what happened? What happened? Get out of here. Yeah, we reject you, Jesus. Get out of here. Go away. We don't like you. You've ruined our local economy. And we're scared of what you can do. So they told Jesus to leave, and he did. He gets back, right back in the boat after telling the demon guy, no, you can't follow me. You've got a story to tell. You go tell your story. He gets back in the boat, and now he gets back to Capernaum, back to the other side. And that's where we pick the story up today. He gets out of the boat, and sure enough, there's a crowd waiting there for Jesus. And they all get around him. Why is there always a crowd waiting for Jesus? Because he's Jesus. 
right? Because he's Jesus. I mean, Jesus is coming back to town, so we want to make sure we're ready. We've heard him teach with his exousia, his authority that's way beyond just simply a job title. He's teaching with amazing power. Not only is he teaching with this exousia authority, but he's also casting out demons. He's got authority, exousia authority over demons, and he's casting out sickness. He's healing people. So everybody, of course, everybody's gathering around him. Everybody wants part of Jesus, and that's the story. We've seen that going on time after time, but then something different happens in verse 22. It says this, Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. Aren't you glad Mark names names? He doesn't name a lot of names of, of all the people in all of the stories. But you know what? He names Jairus, and I think he does that for a reason. You know, I've talked to people in the past who have said stuff like, you know, I just don't know if I can believe in a book full of fairy tales that somebody made up. But here, Mark is naming names because his intent is for those original readers, those first century readers, to read this story and go, oh yeah, Jairus, I know Jairus. I remember Jairus. Jairus, Jairus was the leader of the synagogue. Sure, I know that guy. The whole idea is this is Mark's way to say, check my facts. You know, if you, if you don't really believe what I'm saying, here's a guy's name. He's in Capernaum. He's the guy in charge of the synagogue, and he's got a story to tell. Go talk to him. Isn't that awesome? Ought to bring his confidence that there's not just anonymous people in this story, but that Mark names names. Jairus is the ruler of the synagogue. Now, that's something specific. That's a specific position that he holds. It's not like the Pharisees and the scribes. It's not a priestly role. He is like the, he's the ruler. He's like the executive director of the synagogue. He's sort of the Larry Lynch of uh, the synagogue there. He's in charge of making sure everything works smoothly. Anything that's broken gets fixed. Everybody's got what they need. He just makes sure it's cleaned weekly. He, you know, he makes sure everything gets done. He's sort of the administrator of the synagogue. That means he's not a priest. He's a, we would say, a lay leader. He's non-priestly. He's a volunteer from the community. And that probably means that he was a very, very well-known, kind of upper-class, influential, and affluent person in that community. Everybody knew Jairus. Everybody knew Jairus. I mean, if you were to say the name Jairus, everybody would point at that guy. In other words, this is the first blank on your page, Jairus is a somebody Jairus is a somebody. He means something there in Capernaum. And in verse 22, let's look at it again. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing Jesus, Jairus fell at his feet and implored him earnestly. What does implored him mean? Huh? to beg. He begged him, implored him, please, Jesus, I'm begging you. He says, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the ruler of the synagogue coming and begging Jesus? Who does Jairus run with? Who are his close associates? The Pharisees and the scribes, those are, the, those are his circle. That's his crowd. And how do the Pharisees and scribes feel about Jesus at this point? Did not like him. They were against him. In fact, we saw a couple of chapters ago in chapter 3 where they started to plot to kill Jesus. They hated Jesus. So when they got together, man, they were probably trash-talking Jesus. They're probably laughing behind Jesus' back. It's crazy, wild, miracle worker guy. Sure, remember that time he read uh, the scripture in our synagogue? Yeah, he, he taught with some authority, but what he's doing can't be right. What he's doing has got to be wrong. I mean, we've seen, we've heard him blaspheme. We know we've heard him blaspheme. We've seen him do things that we don't think God wants him to do, and so he must be done away with. And these people don't like him, yet here's Jairus coming to Jesus and begging him 
to come meet his daughter. And the only thing I can figure here is that his daughter's been sick for quite some time. She's been getting worse and worse and worse. And Jairus, is, he's well-to-do, so he's probably had all the doctors in to look at her. They had a pretty solid medical profession back in those days. He's probably had all the doctors. They probably prescribed all the different treatments. He's probably had the, the priests themselves, the, the Pharisees even, and the, and the scribes. He's probably had them come in and pray over her. He's probably had prayer vigils with groups of people praying because she just keeps my little girl. She just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. He's tried everything. And now she's at the point of death, at the point of death. He says, my daughter is at the word he actually uses is the Greek word eschaton. She's at her eschaton. There's a study that we have today called eschatology. It's the study of the end. It's the study of end things and times. The study of the end. And he says, my daughter is at her end. I've done everything I could do. I've tried all of the remedies. I've tried all the treatments. I've had everybody here, and nothing's working, and she's now at her end. There's practically no hope left. So please, crazy miracle worker, I know you know. I know you know what we say about you. I know you know how we feel about you. I know you know that we don't believe in you, but I'm desperate. I'll try anything to save my little girl and Jesus responds not in the way I would respond you know I'd probably respond like Roger responded to me when we called him for our uh, a retreat that we were doing a little event we were doing here a few weeks ago and uh, several other guys had kind of bailed on us and so I called Roger like at the last minute Roger can you come and speak and Roger says always happy to be your last choice <laughs> You know, I mean, there's something about that. You know, they're always happy to, to be the one that you go to out of desperation. You know, Jesus could have been like me, and he could have said something like, you know, I know what you guys say about me. Oh, you of no faith. You're trying, you've got people literally trying to kill me. Why would I go with you? You're not coming to me because you have faith in me. You're not coming to me because you believe in me. You're only coming to me out of desperation. And I'm not really here for desperation, Sucks to be you, Jairus. Too bad for your little girl. But that's not how Jesus responds. In fact, it tells us in verse 24, it's the next blank on your page, Jesus went with him. Jesus went with Jairus. The thing that I get from this, this is really important. Even if he is your last resort, he is still faithful. Even if you pick him last, he still goes with you. I know several women right now who are praying for a lost husband. And he's been far from God for as long as they've been married. And he rejects God. In each of these stories, he rejects God doesn't want nothing to do with God. Don't talk to me about it anymore. I'm sick of you talking. I, I don't want nothing. You can do your religious thing. I don't want no part of it. And they keep shoving God away time and time again. And you and I both know those miraculous deathbed conversion stories, don't we? We know that there's times when people all their lives, they reject, reject, reject Jesus. But somehow when they are coming to their own eschaton, they're face to face with death. That's when somebody shows up, somebody who loves them and sits beside them and says, please give your life to Jesus. Please just trust him with your eternity. You're about to step into it. Just give your life to Jesus. And after years, after decades, after a lifetime of rejecting Jesus, Something happens, and they pray, and they give their lives to Christ, and even though it's a last-minute desperate prayer, he's still faithful. He's still good to go with you. I'm grateful that I serve a Jesus that is that faithful Jairus must have been so happy that Jesus went with him. Aren't you happy? 
Aren't you happy that Jesus goes with you? Aren't you happy that you don't have to walk through this alone? That you have access to his power, his exousia, that you have access to the throne room of heaven, that you can make your request known boldly to him, and the peace of God will guard your hearts in Christ Jesus. It surpasses all understanding. Doesn't that make you happy? Doesn't that make you glad that God is with you? It should, because you and I, believer, we remember a time when God wasn't with us. In fact, we remember a time when God was against us. That's right. We remember when he was against us because all of us, all of us are sinners and have committed treasonous crimes against a holy God. Right, Romans 1, Paul talks about how the anger of God builds against those who continue to deny him. And that the wrath of God is coming for those people. He will punish every single sin. Because God is not only holy, he is just. He's a just God. No crimes go unpunished. And that includes yours and mine. God isn't with us. He's against us in our sin and we deserve what's coming to us. But God so loved the world. Come on. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And that Jesus came to this world specifically to go to that cross with no sin of his own. And on that cross to be my substitution. He stands in for me. And God Punishes his own innocent son for all of the crimes I am guilty of. He punishes his own innocent son for all the crimes you are guilty of. God's wrath is coming for your sin and it's been fully exhausted in the person of Jesus on the cross. That's why when he died, he said, It's finished, it's paid in full, it's over, it's done. And he dies with my sin, he takes it to that grave, but three days later, he walked away from it. And he left it there. And he's alive today to go with you, to walk with you in power, and to bring his new life into your life, to change you forever so that you walk in freedom from that old life, from that old sin, from that old bondage. You can walk in his peace and his power. Come on, somebody ought to be excited about that. Amen. Praise the Lord. I love the way Zephaniah says it, Zephaniah 3. What a name, Zephaniah. It's almost as good as Zeb. Zephaniah. He says this, For the Lord your God is living among you. He's a mighty Savior, and he will take delight with you in, in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. He sings over you. He's with you. In Matthew 28, Jesus promised, he said, I will be with you even to the end of the age. I'm never leaving you. I'm never going to forsake you. I'm with you. In Romans 8, same, same book, Paul, that writes about the wrath of God coming later on. He's writing about believers who have given their life to Christ, and he says this about Jesus. He says, I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. That means you can't even separate yourself from him because once he goes with you, he's with you. He's made his decision and even you can't change his mind about you. He loves you and he's with you. That's good news, isn't it, right? That's good. That's life-changing news. That's change everything about your life news. He's with you. Jairus must have been so happy, so hopeful that maybe, maybe finally this will be the thing. Maybe finally the miracle worker who's done so many other miracles will do a miracle for me and for my daughter. So Matthew, sorry, Mark 5, 24, Jesus went with him. He went with him and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. 
A great crowd followed and thronged about. So it's a thronging crowd. I didn't know throng was a verb. I thought a crowd was a throng. I didn't really know. Uh, they're thronging. Have you ever been in a thronging crowd? Magic kingdom in the summertime. Interstate 75 through downtown Atlanta, pick a time. Right? A thronging crowd, right? Where they're just, they're just knocking you around, trying to get into position, and it's just a mess of a crowd. We, we live in LJ. We don't, really, we don't really know what a crowd is like until next month when Apple Festival hits. And then nobody will be sitting here at the 10 o'clock service. Y'all are going to be all hiding out in your homes with the blinds pulled and the curtains drawn. Stocked up on bread and milk, just hoping, hoping the crowd eases before the weekend, you know, is over. Yeah, come on, you know it's true. How many of y'all are going to leave town for Apple Festival? Anybody here? Nobody? A few of you are going to leave town? Yeah. How many of y'all hunker down? You got your generator gassed up? Yeah, okay. That's kind of what we just kind of lay low on those weekends a little bit because the crowd thro don't even get near Old Highway 5, am I right? because of the thronging crowd. And they're all around Jesus, thronged around him. And then something happens, okay? So everything seems to be going well. Jesus is going with him through this crowd. I don't know if they're elbowing their way through or what they're doing, but they're making progress towards Jairus' house, and then something happens. The story's progressing, and suddenly there's an interruption. There's a woman who, I don't know how she does it, but somehow through the crowd, she moves her way through, and she gets near Jesus. And you know the story, right? You know the story. This is one of these other amazing stories. She just reaches out, and what does she do? I, I can't hear you. Say it a little louder. Yeah, she touches his garment. Now, listen, 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 listen. Mark tells us this story of Jairus. It's about a 22-verse-long story, I think, and then right in the middle, there's this 10-verse interruption of this woman. So this is a significant interruption in his life. She kind of hijacks the story for a good part of this. And we're not going to, we don't have time today to look at both of these. So we're going to look at Jairus' story today. And then next Sunday, we'll look at the story of this woman. But for now, for now, what we know is this woman sneaks up behind Jesus and she touches him. And this stops Jesus in his tracks. He's going with Jairus, and this stops him in his tracks. In fact, verse 30 says that Jesus immediately turned about in the crowd. It didn't just stop him, it turned him in the other direction. Jairus is trying to lead Jesus to his house, but Jesus literally turns around in the other direction. He's interrupted. He's hijacked from Jairus all of a sudden. And by who? By a nobody. Jairus is a somebody, but this woman is never even named in the scripture. She seems to be a nobody. She totally hijacks Jesus' mission altogether. Listen, Jesus, there's no time for a conversation with her. There's no time for you to stop and turn around and do this thing. Jesus, my daughter, is dying. She's at her eschaton, at her end. What does end mean to you, Jesus? You can't stop here. He must have felt very, very hijacked right there in that moment. Can you identify with that? Can you identify with part of your life being hijacked by somebody else, something not really important? You, you know, you're just trying to have a nice dinner out with your wife, and you're just trying to reconnect. You've been busy lately. You haven't had a chance to just connect. You're just trying to have a conversation. There's stuff you got to talk about. There's, there's things you need to explore. There's plans you need to make. You're just trying to have a night out uh, with her, and then somebody that you haven't seen in a long time, you're not even sure you remember their name, they come up there, oh, hey, how are you doing? And they just edge on in, and they sit next to you in the booth, and they talk for 20 minutes. And they hijack your night. You have to just start eating <laughs> so that maybe they'll catch the hit and go away. You ever had that? Some of you have done that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But I've had that happen before. I know you have too. But it may be something important. It may feel from time to time that the work 
of God is hijacked in your life. You know, Jesus, it felt like Jesus was with us. He was with us in our marriage until I found out about that infidelity. And my marriage got hijacked. You know, he was with me. He was with me. Everything was going along smoothly until the accident and that injury. Man, I've been experiencing nothing but excruciating pain now for years. And it seems like Jesus doesn't even know, doesn't even care. He's turned around doing something else. I don't even know where he is anymore. He was with me, but it seems like it all just got hijacked. You know, he was with me in the business. Everything was going well, and everything was growing and moving in good directions until something went sideways, and I started getting sued, and I started getting problems, and I had to close everything down and declare bankruptcy. And where's Jesus? It seems like he's just turned around. He's been hijacked. Have you ever been hijacked in your life like Jairus was hijacked? He was right here, and now I don't even know where he is anymore. Mark just says that it was a woman. He doesn't name her name. We know, all we know about her is she has a severe medical condition, but she's never named. So the next blank on your page is that Jairus is interrupted by a nobody. This somebody is suddenly hijacked by a nobody. And this conversation that Jesus has with her, it doesn't really take very long, but it was long enough. Is long enough. Verse 35 tells us that while Jesus was still speaking with this woman, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Jairus must be devastated. It's over. She's passed away. Jesus did not arrive in time. This woman hijacked my miracle. And there's nothing for Jesus to do now. Why bother him any further? There's nothing for him to do now. All hope is lost. I just need to go home and grieve the loss of my daughter. I bet he burst into tears in that moment. But verse 36, Jesus, overhearing what they said, said to the ruler of the synagogue, and it's the next blank on your page, do not fear, only believe. Do not fear, Jairus, only believe. Jesus hears what they're saying, and he says, that's fear talking. Don't fear, only believe. So do you think Jairus took heart? I I wouldn't have. If I'm Jairus, I'm going, are you serious right now? Dead means dead. That's it. It's over. There is no next chapter for my little girl. I just need to get away from you, Jesus. This was a stupid mistake to begin with. Why did I even come to you? And why did you do this to me, Jesus? Why? Why? You, you were with me, but then you turned around and you gave her what she wants. After all I've done? I mean, here I am, a synagogue ruler. All my life I've been consistent. I've been faithful. I've been generous. I've built the synagogue into something impressive. I don't even know who that lady even is. She sure isn't part of the synagogue. She's not in our church Yet she seems to have gotten the miracle that I deserved. This is supposed to be my story. She's just the interruption. But she got what she wanted, and now I have to go home and bury my Talitha. Don't fear, Jairus. Only believe. Verse 37. And Jesus allowed no one to follow him except for Peter and James and John, the brother of James. So somehow Jairus is heading home and Jesus continues to go with Jairus with only his little inner circle of three. And they somehow get away from the throng. The crowd is thronging, but somehow Jesus 
gets away from them. I, I don't know. That, to me, that seems like another minor miracle that Mark doesn't accentuate. That right here, Jesus has done something. He is under the radar, demonstrated his exousia authority, and he stopped the crowd from following. And he's focused on Jairus and his issue. And in verse 38, they come to the house of Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. There's great sorrow happening, people weeping and wailing loudly. So you got to understand this about first century Jewish culture. It was very common practice. In fact, it was the law that when somebody died that you would have paid professional mourners come and weep and wail to honor the dead. That's the way you honor the dead. You let it all out. And you can't do it enough on your own, so you pay people to come and cry on your daughter's behalf in this case. So Jesus arrives, and they're weeping and wailing. And you know what that tells me? It tells me that they had this prearranged. She was so at her eschaton that they had already arranged for these mourners to be there on the site, ready to go as soon as she passed. And they're weeping and they're wailing, they're crying out sadness for this girl. And Jairus walks into this scene. He can hear their cries around the corner before he even gets sight of his house. He's walking up to all this commotion, all this crying about his own daughter. Don't fear, Jairus only believe verse 39 and when he entered Jesus says to them why are you making a commotion and weeping the child is not dead but sleeping and they laughed at him they go from weeping to laughing scoffing at Jesus Remember, not everyone believed in Jesus, and this is Jairus' circle. It's his people, and they see Jairus showing up on the scene with this crazy miracle worker, and all of a sudden, they, they already begin to have their attitudes change because they don't believe in this crazy, wild man. And so Jesus comes in, and he says this thing. He says she's sleeping, and they start scoffing. They start laughing, and Jairus must be thinking to himself, they're going to be laughing at me next. I've just showed up with Jesus. I know what that's going to mean to my status, my position. I'm, I'm going to lose my place as the synagogue ruler. They might even kick me out for bringing him here. They're going to be laughing at me next. Don't fear, Jairus. Only believe. Plus, Jesus says she's sleeping. Does Jesus not know what dead is? Does he, do, can they not figure out what a cold, non-breathing body is? Of course they know. So did Jesus step into this situation and lie? Was Jesus deluded? Was he accusing them of being incompetent? Or does Jesus have a whole different perspective than we have? Does he look at things in a whole different way? Remember we talked about Mount Everest a couple of weeks ago, and we talked about how it's the tallest mountain in the world. It kills people. It's so tall. There's a zone on it called the death zone. And from our perspective, Mount Everest is a monster killer. But if you could shrink the earth down to the size of a bowling ball, the earth would just be as smooth as the most expensive bowling ball you can buy. You see, from God's perspective, everything looks different. And I think that's what he's saying from his perspective, this little girl is just sleeping. Don't fear, Jairus. Only believe. Verse 40. He put them all outside, and he took Jairus and his wife and, and those who were with him and went in where she was, where her body was laid on the bed. Jairus has to step into that room, her room. That room where every morning he had gone in, Talitha, get up. That room where there were so many memories of her playing with her stuff. That room where he would sing her to sleep at nighttime. And now she's laying there. 
could he even walk in there right now? And how dare Jesus step in here? This is his fault to begin with. He let her die. And now I'm never going to get to see her smile again. Don't fear, Jairus. Only believe. Verse 41, taking her by the hand, Jesus says, Talitha, kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. Get up. Little girl, get up. This right here is the only place so far that Mark has shown us the words in actual Aramaic. He's shown them in her own native tongue. The same words in the same language that she would have heard from her dad every morning. Talitha, kumi, Talitha, get up. And before Jairus can even respond, verse 42, immediately the girl got up and began walking for she was 12 years old of age she's an adult in jewish culture in the first century and they were immediately overcome with amazement well, we've seen Jesus do miracles before where he's healed people, where he's made blind people see, where he's made people walk who couldn't walk before. And everyone has kind of the same response. They're either amazed or they're astonished. They're amazed or astonished. We've seen that all the time. But this is different. They are overcome with amazement. Who is overcome? It's James and John, Peter, James and John with Jesus. And also who? Jairus and his wife. It's Talitha's parents and of course they're overcome they're overcome with amazement the there's one word for this it's the greek word ecstasis or ecstasis what english word do we get from this greek word ecstatic they were ecstatic wouldn't you be because jesus just raised their dead daughter to life and she's up walking around now praise the lord they thought that the miracle had gotten hijacked. They thought that the story had been totally interrupted. But Jesus comes and he brings life to everything he touches. Right? He brings, he is in the converting death to life business. And if he had just come in the first place, there would have been a miracle story to tell. But now that he's raised her from the dead, there's a much better story to tell right and what that means is it's the last blank on your page sometimes an interruption leads to a much greater intervention sometimes when you are hijacked and you feel like God's plan for you is hijacked sometimes it's because he wants to do something even much greater in your life so that his story can be told even more loudly praise the Lord Let's pray together. God, thank you so much.